Hey guys, Desolator Magic here, and finally, after all the uh, days and days of crazy announcements, uh, we can go back to a video that I really wanted to make. This is from uh, actually May 25th, and it was posted by Mark Rosewater himself on Daily MTG. So he wrote this wonderful intro that really says it all. With the release of Ikoria, I've gotten a lot of questions, a number of which I answered over the last two weeks, but I uh, saved the most common question I received for today, as it has been an interesting but somewhat lengthy answer. What's going on with the complexity of Ikoria? I've spent numerous columns talking about things like, then he links to something called New World Order, I don't know what that is, and the importance of simplicity. Okay, there's simplicity and then there's rules confusion, Mark. Anyway, how exactly did this set ever get made at its current complexity level? <laughs> no, just mutate. Not even the set. Literally, just mutate. It's a good question, one which I'm dedicating today's column to answering. And oh my gosh, wait until you hear this one. Mark trying to justify any of his stupid marketudes is like... Olympic level mental gymnastics. This guy is crazy. He thinks he can do no wrong when he does massively screw up and the entire community has backlash for him. Oh, well, you know, they, they must be the ones with the problem. I, I did my job perfectly. He's done that like five times that I've personally seen since I've started playing the game. So he's got the short answer and the long answer. Well, let's breeze through the short answer here. Ikoria is an experiment. Well, that actually is all the explanation I needed. Thanks. Hey guys, if you're a multi-million dollar company and every set you, you know, create could either bomb or like do really well, or I guess somewhere in between, but if it just completely ruins the game with its power level and rules confusion, well then your little experiment just lost, I don't know, hundred million dollars probably over the whole course of when it's in standard, the whole time it's ruining it. Plus, you know, lost customers, lost customer goodwill and stuff from, you know, any bannings that are needed. I mean, it's, you know, over a year worth of financial losses. Like, I'm not even kidding. Do the math. Just think about it. Bare minimum a bad set will cost him $10 million. I mean, that would be like a low, low, low estimate in lost sales and just overall, you know, lost customers in general over the entire time that a bad set affects standard. And that goes double when you look at how long it takes these idiots to ban something. I mean, look at them like, oh, yeah, Emrakul was the problem. Well, it turns out it was actually Aetherworks Marvel. Free casting is always the problem. You idiots, stop printing free casting. I mean, Winoda, it's free casting. Gairuda, free casting is the problem. Look back at the last couple of years. In fact, look at every ban list in every format. Free casting is a common problem that they keep just poking at just let's try it again maybe we'll do it right this time let's try it again in fact the only times i can think of when free casting actually worked recently is when they limited to like mana cost two or, or less so anyway let's see why he felt that they needed to make this quote experiment magic is a game that's constantly reinventing itself who plays who do they play with how do they play i i really don't want any of those three to change Especially if the answer is not at all because standard constructed sucks. <laughs> Where do they play? That changed. Uh, when do they play? Why do they play? Once again, none of those change as much as he seems to be thinking. And if they do change, it's like forced by their dumb decisions. So uh, the answers to these questions keep shifting. No, no, they don't. Causing the game to adapt in response. Part of our job in creating magic is to be aware of all these different factors and adjust the game accordingly. Um, then why do you only listen to an echo chamber of ass kissers on, like, your blog? That's not real. That's not the community. It's just a bunch of fanboy idiots. A big part of that is the willingness to experiment and stretch the boundaries of what's considered acceptable. That sentence makes me want to throw a chair across the room. What's considered acceptable is considered acceptable because anything else breaks the game and we don't want to play it. I don't know if you noticed that or not. Then he even has the balls to say, only by testing things can we get the data we need to guide us into the future. Really? Because before we even get to play with certain cards, almost every problematic card in the last three years, the 15 or 16 cards that got banned, it actually, I'm not kidding, might be 17 now. Almost every single one of them, within a day of the spoiler being posted, the whole community said, well, this is going to be a problem. So you need to test things to get the data to guide you in the future. When all we need to do is look at the card on surface level and say, that's going to be broken. That's not going to work. That's not fun. 
I mean, look at Approach of the Second Sun. Everybody looked at it and said, well, who would want to play in a deck that, that revolves around that? It's obviously going to be a complete and utter control-a-thon. People saw the Scarab God and just said, what the hell? People looked at Goblin Chain Whirler and were like, have you lost your mind, Steel Leaf Champion? I mean, are you kidding me? And uh, Mark, this is your job. You and everybody in like R&D and play design, this is your job. Like you get paid to do this and you've been doing it longer than some of us. And still, still the professional analysts on Reddit and YouTube see a card or a combo or a mechanic and say, that's not a good idea. And we're universally right every single time. There are some outliers, but if you just go with the majority sentiment in the community over anything they've done when it gets announced, we are always right. Always. I mean, the vast majority of people missed Oko. I at least made a comment about it, it might be problematic to have removal on a plus, which is a little under what my reaction should have been, obviously. But uh, yeah, it took, what, three hours for somebody to say, hey, Sahili and the cat combo. <laughs> That's going to be a problem. Hmm, Aetherworks Marvel at the same time as Eldrazi? I don't know about that. So no, they don't need data, they don't need testing, they need to get a clue. They need to get plugged in with like what is acceptable and what isn't. Like what the golden rules of design are. Never, 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 never free cast. Control isn't fun, don't give it too much draw power. Too much color fixing equals five color decks. I mean, th these are just like things that are set in stone. People who don't like sit there and study the game and constantly, you know, design cards, second guess themselves, do math and play tests and all that. People who just like casually play the game are doing better than you at assessing what, what needs to be done and what needs to not be done. That is sad. I mean, that that's like the number one reason that people want Mark to quit is because he just doesn't understand the game and how to design it he just doesn't so let's get the second sentence in context you gotta just let this one all flow together here you ready for this one only by testing things can we get the data we need to guide us into the future one of those questions is what are the boundaries of complexity for a premier set and then to explain premier set because i'm like what the hell does that mean that means like not standard he says r d has decided to stop using the term standard legal set as it implies a little too strongly that our new sets are just about standard oh we're going to that bullshit again they're doubling down tripling down and just rewriting their company motto practically at this point to be standard isn't just for standard remember the whole overarching strategy the root of this entire problem and everything that's gone wrong in magic recently has been that they made a conscious decision to make standard way more powerful than it used to be so that they can sell cards to commander and modern players that is what they said so that's what's behind all of this so i guess if you kind of reverse engineer everything he's saying we decided to up the power level but since that's such a bad idea this is completely foreign territory we're going to push it way too far, call it an experiment, and then use the testing data to guide us. Uh, here's an idea. Or you could, you know, not be greedy assholes, just make master sets and, and collect secondary, you know, uh, alternative format money from that. Oh, and Commander, and the draft sets, and Horizons. Oh, wait, every single product other than Standard is for people who don't play Standard. If anything, you need less products for them and more products for people who play Standard. But no, you want every single product to sell to multiple categories of people wow that's greedy as hell so the second part of that is instead we adapt to how our audience has chosen to play the game you are all playing a lot of different formats so we started calling them premiere sets yeah whatever helps you justify it to yourself you asshole we've spent many years wrestling with what the floor of complexity is for premiere sets really the floor <laughs> A vanilla 2-2 two, two for two. There's your floor. AKA the simplest the game can get while still being fun. And then we also wanted to get a handle on what the ceiling was. Yes, that's the more important one. The most complex the game can be while still being understandable. Well, you blew through that ceiling like Willy Wonka's elevator, okay? Mutate is completely unacceptable. Completely. Then he says, for many reasons which I'll get to below, Ikoria proved to be the perfect testing ground for this question. Okay, they had to do something for this set. Like, they, I think, planned something else and then it got moved or something. So they just had to throw together a set. So they took the idea from Ikoria, which is uh, from like two or three years in the future, and real quick rushed it out. So they knew it was going to be garbage. So they're just like, well, might as well run an experiment too. 
And also, the state of standard was a joke. I mean, look at how many bands we've had in just the last, like, three and a half years or whatever it's been. They're probably just like, well, it's already on fire. Might as well see what happens if we pour gasoline on it, I guess. You know, instead of trying to actually fix it. So who sits back and looks at how pissed off the community is and the, the diving numbers of people willing to play standard constructed, which he did reference earlier. He's like, people are changing how they play. Yeah, they're abandoning standard. A thousand dollar decks during Cons of Tarkir because you idiots decided three color plus fetch lands was a good idea. Bye bye, five to ten percent of the players. Then the unplayable game state from energy. Then the unplayable game state from everything after that. Then you were going to fix things by going to like a 4-6 rotation twice a year. Then everybody threw a bitch fit about, eh, my lands. I need to buy my lands. I need my lands to go six months longer or the whole world will collapse. And then you went back on it. Now we got eight sets, which every time the eight set comes out, it's been a disaster. In fact, it usually falls apart around seven. I mean, it's just been bad decision after bad decision. Now they're just like, let's run an experiment to see the highest level of complexity that people will tolerate. And then whoever decided that just shoved this whole thing through. I'm sure people were like, we can't do this. This is bad. Some of the playtesters were like, this is so confusing and stupid. Even we don't get how it works. And I'm sure Mark was like, no, no, no. It's an experiment. Let's just try it. Let's just see what happens. Once again, people know better, but Mark's like, no, no, we're doing this. And they get so sick of telling him no day in and day out. I've heard this statement from multiple staff members that trying to rein in Mark and his crazy bullshit ideas is like their full-time job. Then I guess eventually they just caved. They're like, eh, whatever, screw it. And the turnover rate at that company is insane, too. So I'm sure some of the people just straight up quit. My theory is that that was the actual reason for reorganizing the whole playtesting, play design thing, because they just didn't have enough staff. And the ones that were in the positions clearly weren't good enough at their job. They were not, they were letting things through that were broken. So the long answer section starts with the audacious statement, when you boil everything down to its core, magic design is about making a fun game for all its players. They wouldn't know what fun is if it jumped up from under a table, slapped him in the face, and stole their lunch money. All they listen to is the pros and the pro scene and the competitive, you know, GPs and shit. That's the only people they listen to. That and a bunch of pro wannabes on his stupid blog and Twitter. Anybody that says anything critical immediately gets blocked. I mean, we're talking Facebook, Twitter, anywhere. They will just block you if they don't like your legitimate criticisms or anything about what you said, or even just asking a question about something that needs clarification. They'll just assume you had malicious intent and block you. What kind of idiotic company does that? I mean, what bad PR? It, it's unreal. So yeah, if they designed it with fun, enjoyable gameplay, and happy customers as the primary thing, they would never print certain control archetypes, control cards, certain mechanics, unfun win conditions. I mean, just everything they've done lately, they wouldn't have done. So obviously him just saying that that's what they do, and that's the number one root of things when you boil it down doesn't mean they actually follow that or do it. I mean, it, you can't just say it and make it true. It, it's not. It is clearly evidently not true that you prioritize fun and enjoyability. In fact, all I ever hear from them, especially in the context of band decisions, is deck diversity and pro-level play. In fact, specifically deck diversity in pro-level play. Well, look at all the decks people can play. And then people say, but none of them are fun to play against. What? What? Huh? Who said that? I, I, didn't, I didn't hear that. Well, then remember, like, at the end of, uh, uh, like, the whole Mono Red Chain Whirler thing, and then when uh, Hour of Devastation was about to go out, like, right before then? You basically had two decks you could play, that's all that was in the meta, and their, their excuse was, well, it rotates in three months, so we're not going to do anything about it. We get our feelings hurt when people say mean things about band decisions because net deckers lost money, because they can't see the writing on the wall that their broken deck is about to get banned. So, out of control deck win percentage above 55% against the other tier 1, you know, competitive decks. That's one of their parameters. Um, not enough decks in the tier 1 meta. That's another one of their parameters. And occasionally, rarely, I think it, it, they mentioned it in one, maybe two band decisions out of the 15 plus that they've done lately. That's when they've actually said, non-enjoyable, unfun game states or game something you know your opponent something non-interactivity whatever just basically oh wait you're having a miserable time playing against this i guess we'll mention that as a factor it's like an afterthought to them so for mark to have the balls to mention that that like when you boil it all down it's all about fun well then you know do that like i i can't believe that he said that 
So he goes off on like this ridiculous tangent where, oh, I divide complexity into three categories. Comprehension complexity, board complexity, and strategic complexity. Okay, well, when it came to mutate, it's how the hell does this work? What are any of the rulings? And how the hell does this work? Those are the three points that, that really people took issue with with mutate. Then under a section called, but wait, there's more, he just makes excuses. Like he even puts them in a bulleted list. One, neither keyboard counters nor companions were all that complex. That's correct. They're just broken. That's why people took issue almost exclusively with mutate, actually. Uh, the, the different mechanics uh, weren't causing problems with one another. Yeah, no, mutate just in a vacuum. People didn't know how it works with anything at all. It was problematic across the board. But there was nothing wrong with the other two. And then, oh, they thematically played well with the set. Yes, they kind of matched the lore and the storyline you pulled out of your ass. So what? That's the last priority. So then he says, yeah, we you know, refined it, we fine-tuned it, we tweaked it, whatever. Um, but we kept asking ourselves if the combination of all of them was too much. No, the first two a chimpanzee could understand and mutate was a disaster. It's an impossible to track board state. I would love to have seen the pros sit there and argue in every single match at like the pro tour in the top 16 about, no, it's a 5-4. No, it has this. No, it has these triggers. No, remember it was this. Oh no, it already flickered and left play three times and then we cloned it. And But remember it was this, but, but that's not written on the card. Yeah, but it's now written on the card effectively because I merged two together and then it was in this order, but I chose this and... I play against it on the computer and I'm like, it did what? Why does it have this? Okay, I'll take your word for it. And by the way, near the end, I love how he drags somebody down with them, but I will agree with this 100%. He says, I talked with Aaron Forsyth, my boss, while the set was in vision design, and I felt Ikoria was an experiment we should run. So what you mean by that is we thought it was. Why would you mention his name and then just say it, it was one that I felt we should run? The very next sentence isn't, and he disagreed. So you're obviously trying to drag him down with you saying, he approved this too, which by the way, like I said, is true. He did. Aaron Forsyth, if you, if you thought Mark Rosewater was clueless about the game and fair fun cards and, and anything good, you should see Aaron Forsyth, the guy who legendarily said in an interview, he didn't think collected company would be anything but a gimmick for draft. He didn't think in tribal, you would want to go get two more on tribals. Like, for free and drop them into play. Are you kidding me? I think that card hit, like, $20. It, it completely shocked him. Plus, he's just straight up an asshole. Like, there have been other staff members that said, I wish he would just stay off Twitter. I think one of them said, like, a nicer version of he should just keep his mouth shut and not talk to the customers. The guy's an abrasive, offensive asshole. He never, ever takes responsibility for anything. And he is unbelievably bad at his job. I would take Aaron Forsyth getting fired over Mark Rosewater any day he is at the end of the day the rubber stamp that keeps approving this shit and keeps like going to individual cards and saying yeah that'll be fine i don't give a shit what mark comes up with if play design and play testing is like no this this is too far this doesn't work and then they reject it he could come up with a with a 2020 that says you win the game for zero mana i don't care as long as they kick it out before going to print Aaron has proven over and over and over that he has zero fundamental understanding of the game, the math behind it, and what makes a good card and a bad card, or a fair card and a fun card. He does kind of hint that generally Aaron might have took some issues with some things in Ikoria, though, because he says the other thing that got Aaron on board was that Ikoria was the last non-core set before rotation, meaning it was the one that would exist in standard for the shortest amount of time. If we were going to experiment, it made the most sense to do it at a time where if it went badly, it would have the smallest impact. What a great logical bar to set for yourself. Well, this might be a disaster, so let's do it at the least impactful time. I've got an idea. Don't do it at all. Or or do like a like a focus group study thing or take a small survey, you know, of the customers before you roll out a new thing to the customers who have proven that it takes them an hour, maybe a day tops to say this is ridiculous. What the hell did they do? Or, oh my gosh, this is awesome. I love it. And uh, accurately. It seems like they could just pick a customer at random who's been playing the game for three plus years and they would still give them more valuable feedback than Mark or Aaron are capable of generating. So I'm not against doing something that might be a little bit confusing on the surface if it's worth it because it's so cool, fun, and interesting and totally new to play with. There have been some mechanics in the past where you got to read up just a couple little general rules about, oh, what order does this happen and what if this, this, and this. But then once you get it, you get it. And then there's ones where you look at it and it makes perfect sense right off the bat, like strive. Like you pay more, you get an extra target. Okay. 
Nothing wrong with Strive, I thought it was a fantastic mechanic, just saying. But the perfect example is Bestow, one of my favorite mechanics of all time. It was so power appropriate. It was powerful, but it wasn't like all in. It was uh, anytime where, where you're progressing and then your opponent does something to back you up a little bit. Not, not destroy your entire hopes of winning and end the game. Not single-handedly overthrow your deck with one or two cards. It's like Devotion. Okay, I'm at nine Devotion. My cards get more powerful. Oh, they just blew up something or they just ambushed me in combat. Oh, no, I'm down to five Devotion, but, eh, you know, five Devotion. Okay, maybe I could build it back up. Okay, they, they just, they beat me back down a little bit, but I'm going to build it back up. That's Bestow. That's Devotion. That's any properly made mechanic. That puts control in its place where it's not just like, in Staring Bridge, <laughs> you're never going to swing at me again. Or other cards in Magic's recent history where it's just like, I hope you didn't want to win with creatures. Because it ain't going to happen now. Hope you didn't want to win with the color, you know, red because, well, my old deck's immune to red now. Those are what people refer to as binary win conditions. They either go off or they don't. They either work or they don't. They get set up and established or they don't. Boring. Boring gameplay. Boring repetitive decks. That's not good for the game. You want gradual ups, gradual downs. You want to go forward and have a back and forth tug of war. Now I'm in, in, you know, first place in the match. It looks like it's going my way. Oh, now it's going my opponent's way. You want back and forth like that. And extra gold stars for everybody if it feels like it's your decision and play decisions and original mulligan decisions that are leading to it. And, and scry decisions are just anything that requires a decision from the player and then that influences the way that the game is swinging. That is ideal peak magic, and believe it or not, Mark Rosewater said that, like, two years ago in an article. Well, I guess he forgot about that. So Bestow was the perfect thing, because it was like, I've got this hyper-powerful super dual creature, um, but then if the one it's on dies, it jumps off and I still have something in play. So I'm putting all my eggs in one basket, but not really, because if it gets, you know, something happens to it, well, I still have something. Okay, I gotta look up what happens if it, you know, flickers if this happens or if, like, the spell targeting fails. Okay, once you know those three things, okay, now you know how it works. Like, yeah, it's a little bit of complexity, but it was worth it because it was such an amazingly awesome thing to play with. It was fun, interesting, dynamic, powerful without being too powerful, and no matter what, it always felt stoppable by your opponent. They never felt caged in, they never felt like the game was over, and they just, eh, five turns later it's gonna be over, but it's basically over now. <clears throat> Winoda and Gairuda and Teferi and Esper prison. So this whole article is him trying to make excuses for what happened, trying to explain, you know, what the logic was and how, oh, guys, it's all just an experiment. We just tried it and it failed. No big deal. Get over it. Well, now we can't play standard for like a year. So thanks. At least, bare minimum, fix your damn mistake and ban some cards, which they're going to do Monday. But like I said in my last video, that ain't going to cut it. Anything they're going to do at this point it, it is not going to cut it because they allowed the power level of standard to get so ridiculous. Nobody wants to play it in its current state. According to all of his polls and surveys, it was like 71% of people aren't happy with the state of standard right now, the current power level. They think it's too powerful. More than half of your customers don't want to play your main format and buy your, your main product right now. Should that be concerning to anybody at your company, Mark? I think it should. I feel like it maybe might might be a thing to consider if you give a shit about how much money you make. Which clearly they're just like, ah, eh, sell them another master's product. Put some fancy box toppers in it, up the price by a hundred bucks. That'll make up for all of our lost revenues in standard. And the, the best thing is it probably will. I mean, hooray, much needed reprints, but they had to go back on their decision to never print another master's uh, product again. Just to like cover for this. Just to cover for how many people they lost out of standard constructed. It's sad. And like I said... It's going to take two rotations to fix this, to flush out all the power level shifting nonsense, which they have, haven't said, okay, starting in the next available set, we can possibly change at this point. We're going to lower the power level back down to something comfortable. Sorry about that. They haven't said that, but assuming they did it, it's still going to be two years. So this little experiment of this set and their little experiment in the last couple sets to, to go to a higher power level. It will actually go down in history as one of the most expensive money-losing disasters ever done by a commercial entity ever in the whole world. I mean, this is like if Wizards crashed an oil tanker into, like, the Gulf of Mexico. All because, one, let's see if we can sell standard to more modern players, and two, let's see if we get up the complexity to the point where nobody knows how the hell the game works. Whoopsies, we probably just lost a quarter billion dollars over two years. Oops. But it's an experiment, guys. It's just a prank, bros. Well, f*** you, Mark. I hope heads roll over this. I hope you get fired or resign or something. Feel free to take Aaron with you, um, and let's get this fixed immediately. You clearly have no idea what you're doing. You're reckless, you're an idiot, and you never learn. You've been blamed for ruining the game for, I don't know, over a decade? 
And rightfully so. On the we're never printing this mechanic again because it was complete ass cancer, aka the storm scale, almost everything 7 and up was your idea. Do you ever even look back yourself personally? Are you even capable of doing that? Looking back at your trail of destruction and all your bad, stupid, pushed ideas that didn't work? And think, hmm, maybe I should, you know, reassess how I do this or get somebody who knows what they're doing to do my job for me. Like, has that ever even occurred to you? From all of his public statements and every time he's in like a live video or, or an interview, it seems like he's just delusional. He is completely just lying to himself. He's in denial over how bad he's managed the game or mismanaged, I would say. It's unreal. And everybody just continues to pat him on the back and say how much they love him because, ooh, then they get a shout out and attention from him on his blog. It's such a toxic environment that isn't conducive to change at all. So we're going to see more of this shit until he kills the game or leaves. It's that simple. It, that's really what it boils down to. So thanks for the peek behind the curtain again, Mark. Very enlightening, very telling. And by the way, cycling sucks too. Thanks for making cycling as a mechanic. That We're really all appreciating that. Ban Zenith Flare. Thanks for watching. I can't wait to see what they try to fix with that pathetic ban announcement on Monday. And I'll see you guys next video.